Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined on this Tuesday morning by Andrew Erickson and by Chris Welsh. Fellas, we are talking buys. We are talking sells. We're going to start off with the running backs. But before we get into any of that, we're going to start off with some Monday Night Football. Again, a doubleheader. And I got to say, it is working out really well that when one of these games is terrible, we at least have another good game to turn to. Uh, we're not going to have that for, you know, obviously most of the year. But it has been a nice, uh, pleasant development with these uh, Monday Night games. Uh, well, did you have a big takeaway from either of these games from a fantasy perspective? Yeah, I sure did. Uh, my Tyree kill take <laughs> wasn't great last week. Um, we were on a roll little... of you hitting those takes yeah. every week, and then that fell off. You flew it too close to the sun. <laughs> <And> then, <Welsh. laughs> a halting break. Uh, I will say, though, I'm still there. I'm still sitting in this plate. Seven targets. Did have a end zone uh, target, which was seven yards underthrown. But Tyler Huntley was so exceptionally worse than I thought he was going to look. But they did do what the logic of the take was, is they were going to try to get the ball in Tyreek Hill's hands. They ran him, I think, three times. They tried to do two different um, screen passes. Tried to go deep at least once. I mean, that that was the game plan of what you wanted. It just... The, t- the takeaway, it didn't work. It didn't work with Tyler Huntley. And really, like McDaniel, you got to really question. That was the other thing that I had said on this. And Erickson and I were talking before we started the recording was like, one of my big pushes here was like, if McDaniel's a really great head coach and he's really innovative. Like, you're going to find ways to what? Get the ball in the hands of the great players. And he didn't really do that with Devon Echam. Like, why would you move away when Huntley is that bad? I imagine he looked that bad <laughs> during practice. So why was Achan not more involved? But yeah, that's a big L on the Tyreek Hill front uh, for your old boy Welsh. Yeah, I mean, Hill, seven targets, Waddle, six targets, Achan, three. Nobody else had more than two. Um, so the guys that we want to be seeing the ball, you know, we're getting the targets, just not uh, effectively. Eric said is, I mean, we, we talk a lot about Mike McDaniel being this, you know, elite, you know, offensive mind. And I agree that he is. I'm not, I'm not trying to make the case that he's not, but you know, Kyle Shanahan, when he's on his third string backup, you know, they still do pretty well. Kevin O'Connell with Nick Mullins, you know, did halfway decently. At least he had receivers that could contribute in fantasy. Uh, Matt LaFleur, you know, with Malik Willis, they were still winning games. It's not happening with the Dolphins. Are their backup situations just that much worse than those other guys? Or is McDaniel maybe uh, somewhat lesser than some of those other kind of offensive masterminds? I mean, I think you have to look at him as, again, not lesser, but maybe just a little bit inferior uh, in terms of innovating around an offensive game plan without his starting quarterback. And why the Dolphins didn't invest more into their backup quarterback position is in question here, where you know the injury history with concussions, with Tua, and maybe they thought Skylar Thompson. Again, they had Mike White. They had him in training camp, and he looked like he was going to be the guy. They let him go. They put Thompson into that quarterback two role, and he obviously was not the guy when they played against the Seahawks. So, look, they've struggled without Tua dating back to all the games Tua has missed. So, Maybe this is more of a McDaniel thing. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but just based on the track record up to this point, he has struggled to get things going. And again, you never know what you're going to get with backup quarterbacks, right? It, it's a very highly variance. You're not really sure. You could just be say that those other coaches have just gotten lucky with some other guys. But I mean, before with Malik Willis, Malik Willis, if you had asked everyone who's the worst backup quarterback in the NFL, they probably would have said Malik Willis. And he is 2-0 and on the Packers, while Jordan Love is 0-2, right? Right. Sam Darnold and Malik Willis, both backups last year, undefeated this year. You know, funny thing, too, like if a fantasy owner drafted Tua, there's no chance you wouldn't have drafted another backup quarterback. Like everybody who would have ended up drafting him would have been like, I got to get somebody quickly. And obviously it's not the same. But, yeah, you would want to have some protection in there. And any of us that have Tua probably also had a nice other backup. And And I will say, too. I think that with Welsh going back to the play of buying one of the Dolphins, it, it's really all about getting Tua back, right? And the early seeking of back is week eight. So that's still the move, I think, to make if you want to buy low on these Dolphins. Your just goal is, hey, not going to play him till week eight. Maybe Tua comes back. I think that he will, but we'll see. Sorry, That's where the uh, goalposts make- move, though. That's I mean, I, the one thing I would say is like I was into buying now and that this would adjust now because I gave too much credit to Tyler Huntley. I didn't think Tyler Huntley would look this bad because we've seen him look very serviceable before. So the goalpost has moved from like, oh, I thought Tyreek Hill was going to be able to put up some big weeks right now and bridge us to Tua. That now looks like, 
no, we need to get to a back. And that's where the buying is right now. So you might have to, you hope you don't have to eat any more weeks, but you know, I'm hopeful still that that target share is going to move up, but boy, they didn't know what they were doing last night. Tony Pollard, 88 yards and a touchdown. He had another good game. Uh, Tajay Spears, just, uh, you know, 39 yards on 15 attempts, but he did get in the end zone as well. In the uh, Seattle-Detroit game, uh, Kenneth Walker, like 80 yards, three touchdowns against what had been the toughest rushing defense for uh, fantasy running backs to go up against. So that was obviously super impressive. He had that ridiculous play where he was getting tackled and got flipped over like twice to stay alive and get a few more yards. So that was really impressive. It looked like a play like you would see on TikTok where someone would be like, Madden's broken. Look at this ridiculous (laughs) play because it looked all glitchy and he bounced. It was one of the coolest plays I've ever seen. It looked like if it was on TikTok, it looked like a challenge that like would a couple would have to do together to like try and do the same kind of like flip over twice. Um, and I could not do that. I mean, that was really impressive. Um, the running backs on the other side also did very well. David Montgomery, 12 for 40 and a touchdown. He also had a 40 yard catch. J- uh, Jameer Gibbs, 78 yards, 14 attempts, two rushing touchdowns as well. Jared Goff did not have an incomplete pass in the whole game. And as Dan Campbell pointed out, he still didn't give him the game ball in that one. Uh, James Williams had a big play he as well. The safety. That's why, because uh, he wasn't, he he's not going to risk throwing an incompletion. He's yeah. like, I'd rather take a safety. Uh, DK Metcalf, also a big game. He didn't get in the end zone, but seven catches, 104 yards. Just a lot of guys that we trust in fantasy having big games in this one, Erickson. Yeah, I would say so. It was a it was basically everything that the first game wasn't on Thursday night between Mason Rudolph because Will Levis uh, ended up getting hurt in that game and they didn't go back to him. The coach said after the game that they would go to Levis if he's healthy, but they're on a bye week, so that remains to be seen. But yeah, it was everything that the Dolphins and Titans wasn't all the points you could want. Again, Ford Field, we're back, baby. Coors Field of the NFL. We got the points. We hit the over. Felt great about that. But I guess the one thing my one of my takeaways was so JSN. 12 targets. He had like 50 yards. I don't know. Kind of wanted a little bit more from JSN just based on the game script, the environment. That is perfect for fantasy points. And I get Walker scored all the touchdowns, so maybe if he had scored, we feel a little bit different. But I I feel like we're still waiting on JSN to... I mean, he's had one really strong game in three weeks or in the, the first month of the season. So again, we're talking about buys and sells. JSN to me is still what I want to hold on to because I think that the bigger week is coming, but just a little maybe disappointed that he didn't put up a higher stat line, especially with Lockett still being heavily involved in, in this offense. Well, any other quick thoughts on this one? I mean, like I, I kind of highlighted, it was a lot of guys doing what we kind of hope and expect out of them in this one, a fun, high-scoring game. Any, anything else stand out to you? Yeah, Jameson Williams was able to get that big one. I mean, that's really, really good coming off of that dud, though we didn't see like a high, high target share, and that's always my worry. That was like, I think we were talking about it last week, where it's like, Ugh, you know, when he gets shut out, that's what I thought the first two weeks was taking away, that we weren't going to have that high variance Jameson Williams. Last two weeks, it's kind of that high version, that high variance version where it was nothing last week. And then it was like, you know, what two catches, 80 yards or whatever. Like it was the few plays that turn into one big play that accounted to his fantasy value. But either way, it was good to see him uh, get back up on the stat sheet. Before we jump into the running backs, I do just have to ask, we're not highlighting him in any of our segments today, but Christian McCaffrey, there was another update, uh, you know, coming on Monday that he has bilateral Achilles tendonitis. He has it in both legs. And I guess uh, Kyle Shanahan was saying that it looks like it might have started in one. Then you kind of overcompensate. It goes to the others. It might be worse in, in one leg than the other. Um But either way, he has this in both legs currently. I saw some quote over the weekend that made me think, oh, maybe we're actually going to get him back sooner than I thought. And now you see this and it's like, oh, maybe it's going to be never. Um, I just want to know the way you're approaching him. Do you take this as an opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to sell low whatever I can get? Do you take this as an opportunity to buy even higher on Jordan Mason? Do you take this as an opportunity to buy low and say, oh, the manager's probably even more panicked now. I can get him for even less. How are you approaching this situation, Welsh? Well, first off, I will not be surprised if a week goes by and they're like, by the way, Christian McCaffrey doesn't have ankles anymore. Like (laughs) we keep getting the same story over and over. They're like, he's going to be okay. And then it's like, no, he lost a foot. And they'll be like, no, he actually has three feet now. And then he doesn't have a torso. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm done with it. Um, I will say this. I think I came on here on the very first show and I said, buy Jordan Mason. 
by Jordan Mason because that would be the guy that I think is going to be able to run way more than anyone is giving him credit for because of this worry with McCaffrey. And Allah, that is exactly what's happening here. Boom. McCaffrey continues to be a big worry. And I would say this. I got asked this yesterday where someone said, would I trade? Oh God, it was like Debo and Josh Jacobs or Debo and Najee to get Devontae Adams and CMC. I was like, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything of high value right now with CMC because I am worried that we're not going to see him at all this season like in season or at the very, very end, this is going to be a playoff save. Could we? Yes. If you're a gambler, if you're a gambling man, then yes, I'm comfortable making moves, but it's got to be low risk stuff. Trading a guy like Najee, maybe one of the guys we're going to talk about here, but I think the likes of like the Debo's and you're seeing even, even the Josh Jacobs and stuff like that. I think the cost doesn't make sense. And maybe it'll change if he goes out and tests it and he actually has feet and he's out there and there's pictures of it and stuff like that. And he makes some cuts and people are comfortable. I think if you want to play it safe, you don't touch it whatsoever. But if you want to gamble, trade low end stuff. But the buying Jordan Mason window was when we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, because now everybody is on to this. So if you have Jordan Mason, you hold on. Or if you want to move off of him, you should get a king's ransom. I don't think it makes sense to buy for Jordan Mason right now, unless someone still believes McCaffrey is coming back in three weeks. But everybody's selling CMC. No one's out there actively trying to buy. Every person I see is like, oh, by the way, I got this offer. No one's going out actively trying to do it. So I'm very worried about the CMC situation. Erickson, what do you think? I just want to buy the other 49ers running back, the one that's leading the NFL in carries right up there with rushing yards with Derrick Henry. I just, I don't, I'm a f- terrified of Christian McCaffrey. I, I posted a poll on X yesterday. Who scores more points this year, Christian or Luke McCaffrey? Guess who's winning the poll? Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> it's not Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> so again, uh, I, I'm joking around, poking fun, but this is a real issue. Every news nugget we get is worse than the next. He's an older running back. The injury is multiplying. It's now in two of his legs versus one. I I, zombie virus. I I just don't want more stress on my fantasy team. You don't need. Why am I trying to get more injured guys? (laughs) My team is already filled with injured players. I don't want someone else's damaged goods. So I'm going aggressively after Jordan Mason. I was in the fantasy forecast. I wrote up today. Basically looking at running backs, I would trade for Mason. I can't find, I can't narrow the list more or, or I can't wide the, the list more of running backs I would trade. There are so many running backs I'd be more than happy to move to get Mason because he's a younger running back. He doesn't have a lot of wear because he's been a backup in the NFL for so many years and they're feeding him so much and he's been super productive. It's just a great thing. I, that's, I think that's the move. It's less about buying Long McCaffrey and more about buying high on Mason because how many opportunities do you get the actual chance to buy a player that leads the NFL and carries, and you're actually going to be able to acquire that player? Again, he's not going to come for free, but usually those players are unattainable. The, the manager just says, no, I'm not trading this guy. It doesn't matter what you offer me, but there are trades where you can make a deal to get Mason, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Again, how has the price changed? Not so sure. And I, I do say, or I do think that the dynamic changes if you have both guys, where you just have to hold both guys. Um, but I, I currently am not in a situation where I, I don't personally have any Christian McCaffrey because I was just drafting Brees Hall instead. So, but we'll get to that well, later. Who would you rather have, Achan or uh, Jordan Mason rest of the season? <sighs> I think they're ranked back to back. That one's tough. I, I don't have an answer for you right now. Okay. Right, <laughs> I, saying, I, I'd have to check my rankings. I, I think they're ranked I, back I'd to rather, back. I'd rather you say that than like just make a, some stats for the sake of making a stance because some, sometimes i do think there is a gray area and it's like well i might need more information to feel really confident about this so i i, I respect that erickson uh <laughs> i'm let, helping nobody <laughs> but be, i respect be, you for be, it true to yourself <laughs> um let's get into our running backs to buy here welsh we'll start with you what running back are you looking to buy and this could be a buy low or a buy high just a running back that you want to acquire well, this is uh, almost like little wavery. This is going to be a try to buy maybe potential breakout where it is dirt cheap. So we're going to play it a little bit lower than some of the names we've been doing. We're going to tank Bigsby. Yes, friends. 
Bigsby saw 12 carries in week one. Then there was a little bit of nothing kind of in week two and three. Then we had nine this past week. This, while not only the Jags offense struggling, but Etienne has failed to have 14 carries in a game all season long, by the way, and now has back-to-back 11 carry games. On Bigsby, some interesting stuff uh, uh, under the hood. Third in the league in explosive yard yard percentage at 19%. And there's only three backs that have 20 or more carries that have a 10% or higher explosive run percentage. Ken Walker, Gibbs with Tank Bigsby. It also, that pairs really well when, you know, explosive yards, whatever. That's just, you know, them making big plays. But it pairs well with that of backs with 10 or more carries. He's seventh in the league in yards after contact per attempt at over five. So he's breaking tackles. He's getting explosive plays. And Etienne's volume is coming down a little bit. Everybody called for Etienne to go away last year. I think we're in a space where Tank Bigsby is a really great buy right now because it's almost to nothing. Frankly, some people are probably talking about him in the waiver wire. I think there's a legit shot, especially as the season goes on and the Jags struggle. And we're going to get more and more tank. This is not me telling you you're going to go and get tank and he's going to be an RB1. But I think tank can start, especially the underlying stuff is telling us this is a guy that can be a flex. And if they were to make a move or something were to happen, tank legit can be an RB2. So this is me looking at just trying to buy somebody that can pop here soon and has really, really good underlying stuff that is telling us this guy deserves more. So if they if they have an analytical department, they're probably going to take a look at this and want to continue feeding tank. So I am buying a cheaper tank Bigsby for some upside. Erickson, you have a long history of debating Tank Bigsby with uh, Debro, uh, you know, when he was coming in, in as a rookie and him and Etienne in that backfield. What are you doing with him now? Are you also looking to buy? I think so, because he's definitely played much better than he has as his, a rookie. And I know that he looked really great in week one, and then he was dealing with a shoulder injury. And I know last week Etienne was also dealing with a shoulder injury, so I don't know why these Jaguars running backs just love injuring their shoulders, but that's what we're dealing with here. I, I do think that the Jaguars are kind of – Still trying to find their identity on offense. Again, it's a team that's 0-4. So when you're 0-4, what do you do? Change things up, right? Doug Peterson's getting asked about his job security. So he needs to find ways to get the ball into the most productive players. And over the first four weeks, Bigsby, I think, has been the better rusher of the two. ETN is still involved a lot in the passing game. So I don't think that this totally neutralizes his value. I think that ETN is hes in a weird spot, right? because he's starting to lose value. The offense isn't scoring as many points, but he's still seeing a lot of the high value opportunities in the offense targets, red zone opportunities. But given the price of Bigsby and given the narrative about how the Jacks for offense is just not great, I think Bigsby is a good buy low because there's a non-zero chance that he does take a bigger role and potentially usurps ETN in his second season. So at the cost of potentially a waiver wire player, I think Bigsby makes a lot of sense to add, especially if you have ETN as well on your roster. And the only thing I throw in is like, this feels a little Rashad White um, Irving-ish, you know, where ETN like Rashad White will still be involved, maybe more in the passing game, but maybe you're going to have Tank more involved in the ground game and potentially those inside the five type of carry. So it's a very cheap acquisition to buy in on. Erickson, what running back are you looking to buy? Yeah, so I'm going on the other end of the spectrum. So I know we were digging a little bit in the waivers for Bigsby. I'm going all the way to the top to my RB1 heading into the year. It's Brees Hall coming off one of his worst games as an NFL pro. He rushed for four yards on 10 carries. And everyone is calling for Braylon Allen to take over the Jets' backfield. Maybe that happens. Uh, I don't think it's going to. Because I'm just looking at the way that this Jets' offense works. Yes, I was not expecting Braylon Allen to look this good, number one, or be this involved. But... The things, uh, the appeal about Hall are still there for me in his uh, in this offense, what his role is. He still leads all running backs in targets this season. That is one of the best things you can have for a fantasy running back. Are you seeing targets in this offense? He's on pace for over 100 targets. Same exact numbers he was putting up last year. High value opportunities. Yes, he was stuffed twice inside the five-yard line in week four. He had one carry inside the five-yard line all of last year. Right. So it's new to him. Okay. Like that's why he doesn't know. I mean, he's never been at the goal line. How, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can score a touchdown when I'm not 40 yards away from the end zone. Okay. I'm, I'm again kidding here, but the opportunities are there for him to put up fantasy points. Like he has way more touchdown opportunities than he had last year 
with this offense. Again, it's not perfect, but I expect the Jets to improve. They have a brand new quarterback, again, who's coming off an Achilles injury. He's going to target Brees Hall in the passing game. I still think Brees Hall has the grep, the, 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 the grasp on the red zone opportunities in the Jets' backfield. So for me, I, I think that he's a buy because he's a player that I think could still finish top of his position just based on the optics of what running backs are. Name a running back that's not in a committee, right? They're almost all in committees, except Kyron Williams. So I think for me, Brees Hall, I, don't, I haven't seen enough this of bad this year to move away from my stance of him as a premier player, an elite player at the running back position. And if there's a window to get that player on my fantasy team, who could be a league winner down the stretch, I'm going to do it. So I, I'm going to buy Brees Hall. Well, what do you think? I, I actually, I'm in a guillotine league with some of our coworkers and Brees Hall, his team manager was cut this week. So he's now available and I'm kind of struggling with how much I want to bid on Hall, given how just, over the moon I was about him during draft season, how it's been, you know, a relative disappointment to that. I still think like Erickson laid out that he is an elite player and I'm still a believer in this offense, certainly relative to, to last year. Um, so I'm really, I'm really kind of struggling with how much of, of my budget I want to spend on him. Um, what do you think about Hall as a buy right now? Yeah, I'm definitely in on this one. I mean, elite, elite players. It, it always, it's not like a one for one with anybody, <laughs> Tyreek Hill, but it's like when you take like super elite talent, and then you start to get discounts or you get like weird underperformers, it's a great opportunity if you have that shot to buy. One thing I like about that for you in the guillotine league, by the way, is if you're feeling that, probably a lot of people are feeling that. And that's going to temper some of the uh, bid acquisition of what people are going to put on fab. And then the same thing on the trade market. Erickson's talked about this a decent amount. Sometimes there are guys that the conversation doesn't ever start in the trade. And then sometimes that performance opens up a window where you can start to buy. That's what this is. But also there is like real legit discount. People are very concerned about Braylon Allen taking away from them. I actually think the Jets have been kind of weird. But if you saw that press conference with Aaron Rodgers, you know, talking about like, we have to be better. The offense has to be better. Defense held them like you can feel that this is coming, that they are going to start slanging the ball. They are going to start getting it out there. If they start throwing the ball well, which I think this is a running back show, but Garrett Wilson might be a decent buy right now, as low as his value is, that's going to make the running game better. And we know Brees is a monster um, behind the line of scrimmage, even throwing him the ball. So I think this is a great time to buy Brees Hall because the discounted prices are starting to happen. Let me ask you this, Brees Hall or Devon Achan, Erickson? This one is Brees Hall. This okay. one I, I can confidently answer it is Brees Hall for me because A Chan, again, when we do get to a back, they're going to involve some other type of running backs. I was surprised about how much Jalen Wright was getting run in Monday night's game against the Titans. So, yes, still for me, it would be Brees Hall. Did you mention this, Erickson? Where do you have Brees Hall rest of season yeah, among the running backs? So, back. I think that he's, he might be one for me. I think I probably have to, I think I probably have to put Barkley one. Because the ECR has Saquon one yeah. and Brees Hall two for the record. Yeah. So I would, yeah, I probably need to adjust and put Barkley one because um, of the, I mentioned Kyron as one of the running backs that's not in a timeshare. Saquon would be the other guy. So I would probably move Saquon one. But again, Brees, Bijan, Derrick Henry, again, those guys are all top five running backs for the season. So um, if there's a window to get one of those running backs, especially ones that are coming off under performances like with Hall, that's what I want to go after. Gimme, gimme. That is the uh, the top four, by the way, in ECR and half PPR rest of the season. It's Saquon, Brees, Bijan, and Henry. So those guys are kind of standing apart from the rest of the crowd right now. Let's talk a little bit about DraftKings. TD, Tutty, taking it to the house, in for six. Whatever you call a touchdown, one thing's for sure. Touchdowns matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL, on the ground, in the air, from the special teams or defense. We don't care how they score them. We just want to bet on touchdowns. And DraftKings Sportsbook is delivering. Ready to place your first bet? Try betting on something simple, like picking a player to score a touchdown or how many touchdowns will be in a game. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your pick. Week 5 has some standout games. While I'm interested in Jets, Vikings in London, Minnesota laying two and a half points in that one. Ravens, Bengals with the Ravens laying two and a half points. Also, the clear best game on the slate is Bills, 
Texans. Houston is laying just a single point in that one with a total set of 46 and a half. That game could be an instant classic if Josh Allen and CJ Stroud are at their best. Lines and obs subject to change on those matchups, of course. Ready to do a touchdown dance of your own. New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one place to bet touchdowns. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. And use code Fantasy Pros. That's code Fantasy Pros for new customers to get two hundred dollars in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Welsh, I know we're talking uh, football with these DraftKings promos, but uh, MLB playoffs start today. Who are you betting on there? Oh, baby, uh, not the Diamondbacks is who I'm not betting because <laughs> hey, I, they... I almost said that. I almost framed it as you can't bet on Arizona, and I didn't because yep. I was being polite. Uh, probably Baltimore, actually. Your team, you know, Corbin Burns coming uh, out the uh, first shot. I like that. You're a class act. I appreciate that. <laughs> not the Diamondbacks, though. Uh, not not the Diamondbacks. All right, let's oh, yeah. go to our running, running backs to sell here. Welsh, who are you selling at running back? All right, the running back I'm looking at is not a panic, slam dunk, go and trade him now. Sometimes we do talk about those in here where we're like, hey, get out of this. But this is a where the value is type of player that I think is going to change as the season goes on. The other little tricky thing about this is this is kind of coming off of like the worst game. The player I'm talking about is Packers Josh Jacobs, where he had nine carries this past week. Not great. Obviously, week two, he went off. But I think there's just some overall scheme situation and some signs that might be telling us that he probably isn't going to be a work workhorse for the rest of this season. 62.8% snap percentage uh, at running back, and that's currently worse than DeAndre Swift. He's got a 54% attempt percentage, which is in that lower 20 range. That's not completely uncommon. We've seen some running backs be efficient with lower attempt percentages, but this kind of screams a little bit like that Rashad White situation. If we take out that week two blow up that he had, which is like 132 yards or whatever, He's averaging just 59 yards per game and has a two-point decrease on his expected fantasy points versus what he's actually putting out there. Um, he's still solid, just not a bell cow. And I also think an important factor here is this team is not necessarily, I don't think, is going to want him to be a bell cow because these smaller sample sizes or these smaller sizes are going to end up pushing out better results because you can keep him healthy. And they've run rotations of backs before. The problem has been... Who are the backs that they can rotate? Because Lloyd got hurt. Well, enter Emmanuel Wilson, who this past week, I think, had like a 40% snap percentage. And Wilson on the year has a higher zone concept success rate than Jacobs. So that might be where they want to run. You push either of the running backs in. He's got a lower stuff rate, so he's being stopped at the line less and has equal to the yards after uh, contact that Josh Jacobs has. So I guess what I'm saying is, is he's making big plays. I think they're going to want to use him more because it saves Jacobs and he made that big play uh, out of the backfield receiving. So Emmanuel Wilson is looking good, setting himself up as a player that is going to get a little bit more run. You do have Lloyd coming back at some point. Really, this is Josh Jacobs is at that tippy top of like, you see yards and ranks that I think even coming off of this game that we just had, it's not a bad time to consolidate and get off of him because I'm just worried we're not going to see 20, 25 plus uh, touch games a ton moving forward with this offense, especially with how they sling the ball. So I am trying to sell Josh Jacobs. Erickson, Josh Jacobs is at RB 13 in our half PPR rest of season rankings, according to consensus. Um, does that sound about right? And and that's a spot where you can probably get some good value for him, um, even if some folks are feeling the same as, as uh, Welsh. Welsh, send him my way. Uh, I'll take Josh Jacobs off your hand. So for me, so I still like Josh Jacobs a decent amount. I know we've compared his situation a little bit to Rashad White and ETN. I think I feel most comfortable about him. Rest of season. I agree that comparative. His, yeah. his running back counterpart in Emmanuel Wilson. The thing with Jacobs for me is he still hasn't scored. He hasn't had that massive touchdown game. He is one of these regression candidates. Love regression. He is tied with Najee Harris for the most red zone opportunities this season without a touchdown. So, Welsh, I, I don't think right now is the time to sell. And that, but I also your, said, I don't think this, I literally phrased the start. This is not a screaming, yeah. you have to go and hit the button and sell him this moment because also it's his worst game. That's the worst time to sell off of these guys. So I am agreeing with you. And I also don't think his value disappears. I don't think this is like Rashad White. Rashad White was a is kind of a panic situation. He will still be valuable. I have, I think, 
if you said, hey, is he going to be a top 24? Yeah, I think he could be a top 24 overall back rest of season. I just don't think he stays in this territory. But sorry, I, I jumped in on yours. No, you're, no, you're good. You're, you're fine. I, I think with Jacobs too, I don't want, I mean, I want parts of this Packers offense. It's when you compare to the Jaguars, I mean, who knows how their offense is going to be. The Buccaneers, okay, they've been up and down. But with Jacobs, and you look at what he's done in the two games that Jordan Love has started, teams are not stacking the box against Jordan Love when he's the quarterback. Josh Jacobs has 26 carries combined in the in two of Jordan Love's starts this season. He's ran into a stacked box one time in those 26 carries because the Packers have so many weapons on offense that they can throw to, it's spreading defenses out. So for me, I still like Jacobs, and like you said, not a screaming sell. Someone, yes, that, hey, if he scores two touchdowns against, I believe the Packers are playing the Rams this week. If he scores three touchdowns against the Rams or two touchdowns, then okay. Now it's time to sell high on Jacobs because now everyone views him as a, oh, top five fantasy running back rest of the season. Yeah. That's probably not the case. So that's the only pushback I'll give. Um, and I do think that bringing up and comparing him to guys like White, ETN, is a good way to kind of gauge where he is at. And I think that I would value him higher than those two guys where you're seeing the, hey, this backup running back is starting to create a timeshare with the starter. Should I be panicked? Jacobs, I'm least concerned about versus the other two guys. Yeah, and, and I think it just ends with like, you know, where does that like upside go? Like, I'm just, I don't believe that we are going to see him become a season long top 10 RB. So unlike some of the guys that we're selling sometimes, like I said, I think there's a floor to the value. He'll still be out there. But a lot of people are asking like, hey, if I can go and get, you know, I'm just going to throw out like right now, DK Metcalf and I could trade Josh Jacobs, should I do that? It's like, that's the type of stuff. Like, I'm just looking to get out because I don't think there's this huge ceiling anymore. And if you can take advantage of a two touchdown game to sell him off for a equative value at a different position, that's what I'm doing. Because I think as the season goes on, it's going to taper back down. It's also in their best interest to not have him out there 20 plus touches because he has been efficient. And also, like I looked at this, he's not like inefficient. He's getting yards after uh, contact, good yards per carry. You know, like this is still like a, a solid back. I just don't think it's going to behoove them to give the, him massive amount of touches, especially when Emmanuel Wilson is showing off a little bit and you got Lloyd coming back soon. So we're kind of semi in agreement. I'm a little bit more selly than you, but I think we have the same like concept on how to approach him. Erickson, who are you selling? My buy low from two weeks ago that I I thought it was the major L, but then apparently DeAndre Swift back from the dead. DeAndre Swift is going to be my major sell this week. Had a his best game by far as a Chicago Bear, 16 carries, 93 yards, scored the touchdown, heavily involved in the passing game, caught all seven of his targets for 72 yards. He had a 30% target share. This is not sustainable. <laughs> this is not sustainable for DeAndre Swift given all the weapons they have on offense, the three receivers, Cole come at a tight end, a three headed monster. I know that turned into a two headed monster at running back, but I think that this is a gift. If you drafted Swift, it's obviously been a tough ride. The first three weeks of the season week four was great. Did you start him? Probably not because what had you seen the first three weeks that gave you the confidence that you should start him, especially when you couldn't get it done in such a soft matchup against the Indianapolis Colts in week three. So for me, I'm using this opportunity to get out from Swift to ship him off. They're playing the Panthers this week. Please, I want to highlight how bad the Panthers run defense is to the person I'm trying to trade Swift to. I can't buy into him long term. The team takes out Swift at the goal line for other running backs. It's been Herbert. Now it's Roshan Johnson in that red zone role. So I don't think that the receiving is going to sustain. I think it's a good process to sell guys after they have career games that look way different or season high games that look way different than what we've seen up to. I don't think this is Swift turning a corner per se. I know that they obviously got him more involved in the passing game, but I just don't think that's going to sustain. So for me, the Bears also had another injury on their offensive line. I think that's a major issue for this team moving forward, just the offense in general for Chicago. Their offensive line is a patchwork offensive line. So I just don't think they're going to find the same type of success, especially in the passing game. So Swift for me is going to be a sell high. I, I totally agree with this one. Um, I would be very happy to sell if I can get um, anything of value coming off of this big performance. Welsh, what are you doing with Swift? If you can get anything of value. I'm going to tell you right yeah. now, if somebody offers you DeAndre Swift and tries to tell you why this is good for your team, you know it's a bad what? idea. You just need to send them the Panthers uh -huh. numbers against running backs. <laughs> Just, I'm do listen, did you see listen, Chase Brown last week? I'm doing yeah. you a favor. Like if you start telling people why, I, of course I'm with this. Like 
It was a disaster, this entire team. We thought this was it. It was going to be the big Roshan week. They used some of Roshan. Like, if you can trade him for value, I completely agree. I just don't know. I, what I think is going to happen here is you're going to get people that are going to get what the best value will be out there, and they're going to send questions to us like on Thursday on fantasypros.com slash chat. If you guys hang out on our Discord, we do a show at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the extra point, people are going to be like, okay, so I got my offer. Khalil Shakir for DeAndre Swift. Like that's what I think you're going to see. I don't think you're going I don't think you're going to see like the really good high. So I'm in agreement with you because DeAndre Swift is a mirage. It's not real. And I would sell off of it, but I think push comes to shove people are not going to get the offers that they think when they hear this unless, you know, people do explain this is why it's better for your team. Let's do some buy, sell, or holds for the running backs here. We've got a couple of trios I want to throw your guys' way. First one, Ramondre Stevenson, Devin Singletary, and Nick Chubb, who is starting the practice window now. Again, that's Ramondre Stevenson, Devin Singletary, Nick Chubb, Erickson. Who are you buying? Who are you selling? Who are you holding? I'm going to buy Ramondre Stevenson, acknowledging that he is extremely risky, but if I need, I think that he has the most upside of these three running backs as a running back who could see a three down workload the patriots schedule gets better in the second half of the season the risk is obviously this guy can't fumble the ball anymore if he fumbles again i don't know if he's going to be the starter so that is the major concern but i'm shooting for upside when it comes to more of these trades i'm thinking about okay if i'm right about stevenson then i think that he's going to run circles around singletary and nick chubb so i'm going to buy stevenson i'm going to hold singletary because i feel secure about his workload Again, the Giants offense is not something to get excited about, but he's got some decent matchups coming up and nobody's coming for his job. So I'm going to hold Singletary and I'm just going to sell Nick Chubb, not because I don't think that he can be productive coming back, but I have major concerns about the Browns and what this offense is. Are they going to trade Amari Cooper? I don't know what's going on. And I think there's a lot of hope with Nick Chubb always open his practice window. What can you get for him? I, I kind of was viewing this as, could I get the most for Chubb? out of these three running backs. And that's kind of why I put him as my sell. Not that I think that he's going to be horrible when he comes back, but probably slow to come back to get up to a full workload. And I think that the quote unquote hopium around Chubb could be higher than Stevenson coming off two bad games and Singletary obviously coming off a Thursday night dud. So that's kind of why I put Chubb as my sell. Yeah, I was I was really curious to see what you guys would do with Chubb because I think you could make a decent case for any of buy, sell, or hold for Chubb, depending on on your point of view. So um so selling for for Erickson, uh Welsh, what are you doing with Chubb and also Ramondre and Singletary? Yeah, I'm not gonna go too crazy long because I co-sign uh everything there. I'm I'm still buying on Ramondre. I don't even think it's like one more fumble and he's out to Antonio Gibson. He is still that guy. He's still their workload guy. I don't think that's going to go away. He does need to like get it uh, cleaned up a little bit, of course. The Nick Chubb stuff, I think it's amazing. You know that he's like they're opening up the practice window and stuff like that. But even if he comes back, I think you're going to have to keep some limitation to it all season long. Jerome Ford is going to get usage. This team also stinks. Like Deshaun, I don't think that's going to make any big change. So I would be selling this opportunity of like you know, hey. Nick Chubb's coming back, you know, like do that. Like Nick Chubb is going to help your team. Like I would be absolutely selling that and then hold on Devin Singletary. So I co-sign. One other trio here, DeAndre Swift, who we just talked about, Chase Brown coming off a big game and Braylon Allen, the backup in New York, but has looked really good when he's on the field. So Swift, Chase Brown and Braylon Allen. Welsh, we'll start with you on this one. Who are you buying? Who are you selling? And who are you holding? <sighs> this is a tough one. I Well, I'm selling DeAndre Swift because we've already talked about that. I think I'm holding Chase Brown and buying Braylon Allen. I could have switched that a little bit. Obviously, like Chase Brown got more involved and you kind of hope that that would continue and he can be more involved in the passing game. Just Zach Moss is annoying. I think he'll always be annoying no matter what if Chase Brown started popping up. Uh, even though we're, you know, kind of buying in on Brees Hall and, you know, this this low range of like, oh, people are kind of down on him. That kind of could be a, a, as an effect of Braylon Allen. But like Braylon Allen looks really good. Like they're going to keep using him. And maybe this team ends up just being like that heavy two back system. Just keep throwing the ball to these two guys with your occasional Garrett Wilson. So I don't know if I feel staunch about this, but buy Braylon Allen, sell DeAndre Swift and hold Chase Brown. Erickson. So I talked about selling DeAndre Swift. So I'm going to do that again here. I'm going to hold Braylon Allen just because I think that he has looked great. And he also has that other upside where what if Brees Hall gets hurt, right? Then Allen takes over this backfield 
And then he's a no doubt top 10 running back rest of the season, if not top five. So I'm going to hold Allen and then I'm going to buy Chase Brown. I know that it's kind of buying high after he had the monster game, but this is what we were waiting for. Again, we talked about this, I think, on every single episode. It's like Moss keeps winning the battles, but Chase Brown's going to win the war, baby. And at least in week four, we saw more of that from Chase Brown. So super excited about him rest of season. And I think that we might see the gap widen even more in this next matchup, right? You have the Bengals taking on your Ravens, Worm. Do you think that Zach Moss is going to run the ball on the Ravens? No. Exactly. So if he has an absolute dud of a game and they're feeding Chase Brown because they need that explosive element, then I think that Brown right now, again, it's, it's it was a 50-50 split still, even though Chase Brown ended up scoring more touchdowns and was more involved. I think that that widens even more in favor of Chase Brown in a high pass, again, high scoring game. That's what they need. The Bengals have to score points to win games. They, their defense is horrible. They couldn't stop Chuba Hubbard. What do you think they're going to do against Derrick Henry? I fear for those men's lives. I'm terrified for that Bengals defense. So for me, this screams, hey, they need to get Chase Brown more involved. He was great in week four. Let's keep feeding him. So I'm going to buy high Chase Brown. To, to be fair, I'm not sure Chase Brown can run on the Ravens either, but I think they could use Well, he's him. got a better shot, I would say. The, I mean, yes, he has a better shot of breaking a long one. Yeah. Um, but uh, the Ravens run. I mean, the Ravens have flaws. I know uh, they just had a big win Sunday night. But the run defense has not been one of them. It looks really good so far this year. Uh, don't forget about our weekly trade live stream on our YouTube channel where you can come and ask your specific trade questions. We'll be with you every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. For those listening on the podcast, just go to youtube.com slash fantasy pros, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified of all our weekly live streams. For Erickson and Welsh, I'm Ryan Warman. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time.